for Coach Raymond Berry's New England Patriots. The 1988 season began with a warm welcome home for returning tight end Russ Francis. As New Englanders celebrated the return of a favorite son on a dark and stormy afternoon, there was a different sort of reception arranged by Steve Grogan for the arch rival New York Jets. In his club record 14th consecutive season, Grogan added to his team passing records with 16 completions, mostly to his wideouts. Stanley Morgan, the club's all-time leading receiver. Cedric Jones, the sure-handed third-down possession receiver. And game-breaker Irving Fryer, who caught six passes and got deep for two quick-strike touchdowns. On a day when remaining upright was a decided challenge, the Patriots cavorted amongst the raindrops and danced their way to victory. After an early field goal by New York, the Patriots poured on 28 straight points, including a perfectly executed draw play for a touchdown by Craig James. The defense was missing injured linebacker Ed Williams, but led by first-time starter Johnny Rembert's rambunctious play, the Patriots blitzed the Jets for a total of five sacks and kept the pressure on throughout the game. Number 77, defensive end Kenneth Sims contributed several key plays, including five tackles and an important fumble recovery before an injured Achilles tendon sidelined him for the rest of the season. A season which began with a bang, but a season during which injuries and strange incidents didn't just rain, they poured. It would prove to be a challenging test for a team of character. Facing one of the NFL's toughest schedules, the Patriots' first trip was to Minnesota, where five turnovers and other assorted indignities enabled the playoff-bound Vikings to turn the Metrodome's lights out on the Patriots. Back home for week three, Steve Grogan relit the scoreboard against Buffalo with two more touchdown passes, one to Stanley Morgan and the other a bomb to Cedric Jones as the Patriots built a 14-3 halftime lead. But the news was not all good news as number 56 perennial all-pro quarterback terrorist Andre Tippett became the Patriots' second starting linebacker to join the injured list. And a field goal with just 11 seconds left won the game for the Bills. The next week in Houston's House of Pain, New England again led early. But six more turnovers helped the playoff-bound Oilers in prolonging the Patriots' tailspin. In week five, the New England faithful urged their team to another early lead. With the offensive line hurting, Tom Ramsey started at quarterback, and fullback Robert Perriman soared to his first pro score. But still another element was needed to upset the Colts. In the fourth quarter, enter number two, a young quarterback from Boston College by the name of Doug Flutie. Now, as everyone knows, Flutie is not a prototypical pro quarterback, but he has the innate ability to move in any direction and somehow to get the ball to an open receiver when least expected. Against the Colts, Flutie led the Patriots to two fourth quarter touchdowns and a much needed victory. Flutie to pass again, let it go long, Morgan open, touchdown! to Stanley Morgan. What more could you ask for? Flutie fakes the handoff. Naked bootleg left. Flutie lots of running room. Touchdown! Touchdown, Doug Flutie! The excitement is back at Sullivan Stadium. 23 seconds left, fourth quarter. Doug Flutie, touchdown! 
touchdown run, 13 yards out. This place has gone icky balooky. Doug Flutie was named AFC Player of the Week. But the next week, the Patriots made the previously winless Green Bay Packers look like Vince Lombardi's best. As Coach Barry stated, our team somehow never lost belief in itself. They just sucked it up and went right at the league's best offense, the previously unbeaten Super Bowl-bound Cincinnati Bengals. Patriot pressure turned touchdowns into turnovers, six of them in all, led by the AFC's Defensive Player of the Week, Johnny Rembert. Five interceptions by five different Patriot defenders, including Fred Marion, Jim Bowman, Tim Jordan, and Rod McSwain, set up four touchdowns for the running game, including one on a fortuitous bounce in the end zone. Goal line offense and defense. Second goal from the one. Jones in motion. Hand off Perryman. Oh! oh the football! Recovered by Stevens for a touchdown! Rookie John Stevens' first pro touchdown started off New England's scoring parade, which culminated with two touchdowns and a near touchdown by number 21, Reggie Dupard. Doug Flutie's first pro start at Sullivan Stadium consisted mainly of finishing off the scoring drives which the defense had initiated in a satisfying 27-21 victory over the AFC champions-to-be. As the season rolled toward November and the halfway point, Doug Flutie led the Patriots to another early lead over the Bills, this time in Buffalo. While the passing game had enjoyed its moments of glory during the season's first half, it had also been somewhat inconsistent. And more and more, the offense became centered upon a down-to-earth running attack, which gained strength and momentum with the rapid development of tailback John Stevens, who thundered for 134 yards against the Bills, the first 100-yard rushing performance by a Patriot in more than two years. On defense, Andre Tippett returned from a month of inactivity, but defensive end Garen Varis went down, the fourth defensive starter to be lost to injury. Still, the Patriots' gutty defense forced four turnovers, including an interception by Raymond Claiborne, which set up a fourth quarter tie. But once again, a last second Buffalo field goal nipped the Patriots at the wire and propelled the Bills toward the AFC championship game while New England nursed a three and five record at midseason. The season second half began with Victor Kayam assuming team ownership from Billy Sullivan. But the man behind the men on the field remained Raymond Barry, the winningest coach in Patriots history, who planned a first place surprise for Doug Flutie's former team, the Chicago Bears. Flutie back to pass. He's going long left side. Wide open Irving Fryer down the left sideline. Cut back in at the 30. Fryer's going to go all the way. Touchdown, Patriots! And Flutie had more surprises for his ex-teammates. Flutie fakes the handoff. Bootlegs right now. Lost it to the end zone. Touchdown! Lynn Dawson! And more surprises. Flutie back to pass. Third down. Let's it go to the end zone. Touchdown! Lynn Dawson's two scores helped New England to a 20-7 lead at the half, while the Patriots' patched-up defense held the dangerous Bears to barely 200 yards of offense. Doug Flutie completed just six of 18 passes, but four of them were for touchdowns, as the Patriots dominated the NFL's best defense from the game's very first play in a landslide 30-7 victory. The following week, it was the Miami Dolphins and Dan Marino's turn to test one of the few teams with the speed, tenacity, and toughness in the secondary to play nose-to-nose -nose with the Dolphins' receivers. Marino threw 51 times, but the Dolphins scored just 10 points, while the Patriots threw 14 times and scored 21. John Stevens, with 85 carries in three weeks, 
had his third straight 100-yard game and carried the Patriots to their 200th regular season win. It was fittingly pouring in the Meadowlands for the rematch of the rain-soaked opener against the Jets. And again, the New England defense poured in on New York. Doug Flutie also reigned on the Jets parade, completing just six passes, but as usual, at least one was for a touchdown. Mostly, Flutie handed off to John Stevens, who slogged for 87 more yards despite the slippery conditions and a New York defense which followed him everywhere. The game's biggest play came on third and eight, when Doug Flutie found Robert Perriman for an 18-yard gain to the New York three, which set up a clinching fourth-quarter touchdown by John Stevens in a 14-13 victory over the Jets. The next week in Miami, the Patriots held the men of Marino to three points and just 13 in two games before heading into Indianapolis for the kickoff of week 13. Across the 10, 15, comes near side, across the 20, breaks three, and he's loose! There goes Sammy Martin, goodbye! Touchdown, Patriots! The first kickoff return in the career of Sammy Martin, including high school, college, or pro, jump-started the Patriots, and the defense shut down another star performer, holding Eric Dickerson to just 45 yards. Russ Francis looked like his old all-world self with two key catches. And with Lynn Dawson, Steve Johnson, and the return of injured backup Willie Scott, New England enjoys quality depth at the tight end position. Although the Patriots outgained the Colts, three turnovers and two missed field goals halted New England's win streak at four. Three seconds left of the fourth quarter. Snap, ball is down, kick is up. No good! And the ball game is over! Back home for week 14, Stanley Morgan latched onto his team record 500th career reception to go with his club records in receiving yardage and touchdowns. The defense also set records, holding the Seattle Seahawks to just 65 yards and only two first downs. New England controlled the ball for more than 41 minutes, thanks in good part to John Stevens, who became the fifth player in Patriots history to rush for more than 1,000 yards. It was the fifth win in six games for the Patriots, their third over a division champion, and it ran Doug Flutie's record in Sullivan Stadium to 10 and 0. After a year and a half's absence, Tony Eason returned to the lineup in week 15 against Tampa Bay. With a wind chill of 25 below, each team was limited to just one touchdown during regulation time. But during a frigid, sudden death period, Eason led the Patriots to their first ever overtime victory. Back to pass, third and six. Eason lets it go long, near sideline. Irving Fryer, great catch at the 15. Ball is down, kick is up. And it's good! He's done it! Jason Starosky's kick gave the Patriots their sixth victory in seven games. But in Denver, for the season's final game, the Patriots needed one more win in order to make the playoffs. Before a national television audience, John Stevens burst free for 130 yards, his fifth 100-yard game. And he came within three carries of Jim Nance's club record of 299 in a season which didn't at all hurt his chances for winning Rookie of the Year honors. The season's quarterback odyssey ended with the re-emergence of Steve Grogan, who replaced the re-injured Tony Eason. The Patriots outgained the Broncos everywhere but on the scoreboard and they had to find solace in having overcome a bizarre first half of the season to gamely remain in the race until the season's final moments. The Patriots' special teams featured the punt returns of wide receiver Irving Fryer, the team's career record holder in punt return yardage, who finished third in the AFC for the season 
and the kickoff returns of number 82, rookie Sammy Martin from LSU. Another breakaway wide receiver who adds a hold-your-breath dimension to New England's kick return teams. At the other end of the kicking game, another rookie, Miami free agent Jeff Fiegel's punted long and high, enabling the coverage team to play second in the entire league. Led by Mosey Tutupu, Jim Bowman, Darrell Holmes, Vincent Brown, Rod McSwain, Danny Villa, and rookie special team star Marvin Allen, the Patriots repeatedly down the ball near their opponent's goal line or punished any runner who tried to escape his own goal line. They trapped and swarmed the return man, or forced him into a fruitless path of retreat, or better still, forced him to cough up the football. Despite the team's struggles during the season's first half, the red, white, and bruised defense finished second in the AFC, allowed the fewest first downs in the AFC, was first in the NFL in third down defense, and in six games, limited the opposition to just one touchdown and or one field goal. Number 72, Rookie nose tackle Tim Goad from North Carolina played like a veteran as he occupied two blockers, clogged up the middle, and was named the team's best defensive lineman. Another of the team's best linemen, Garen Barris, was limited to half a season. So number 96, defensive end Brent Williams, stepped forward and led the team in sacks. And if he happened to miss his man, number 97, Milford Hodge, was there. With an eye toward the future, the linebacking core featured young hitters like number 59, rookie Vincent Brown, and second year man, Tim Jordan, number 93. In his first year as a starter, inside backer Ed Reynolds, number 95, was third on the team in tackles, while number 50, Lawrence McGrew, successfully switched from the inside to the outside. Number 56, Andre Tippett, added to his career record sack totals and for the fifth consecutive season was voted to the Pro Bowl. Also voted to the Pro Bowl in his first year as a starter was number 52, Johnny Rembert, who devastated the best offensive players any team can throw at a linebacker. With Tippett on the outside and Rembert on the inside, the Patriots' defense revolves about a matchless set of Pro Bowl linebackers. The Patriots' defensive backfield has been together since 1984, and since then has collected a total of more than 100 interceptions. Nickelback Rod McSwain contributed his share of big plays while free safety Fred Marion, number 31, led the team in tackles and tied for the lead in interceptions with strong safety Roland James. Among the leaders in passes defense was cornerback Ronnie Lepet, while expertly patrolling the other corner was the team's all-time leader in takeaways, Raymond Claiborne, with 35 career interceptions. Offensive linemen Mike Babb, Sean Farrell, Ron Wooten, Bruce Armstrong, Danny Villa, Trevor Maddich, Paul Fairchild, and Tom Rader will be attempting to protect and keep healthy quarterbacks Doug Flutie, Tony Eason, Steve Grogan, and newly acquired Mark Wilson. A rebuilt offensive line made possible a simplified offensive game plan, which included fullback Robert Perriman's hard-nosed power as well as the proven scoring punch of fullback Mosey Tatupu. Tailback Reggie Dupard led the team in receptions, 
while most eyes were focused on the other tailback, John Stevens. Hand off Stevens, cuts it to the outside on the left, gets some running room. He could be gone. Touchdown! Top draft choice John Stevens of Northwestern Louisiana State was second only to Eric Dickerson in AFC rushing and started in the Pro Bowl. No one appreciated his abilities more than Offensive Lineman of the Year, Sean Farrell, and tackle Bruce Armstrong. He's a great open field runner, and he runs through traffic real well. He has the ability to exploit holes real quickly with Offensive Lineman really like. So if he does get a good block, he'll get you 8, 10, 12 yards, and uh, that makes blocking a lot more fun. I knew he'd be a great back. I thought everybody else felt the same way. Everybody indicated that they wanted to see John get the ball 25 to 30 times a game. And John's the number two in the AFC in rushing, and he really has been uh, the bulk of our offense. And that's quite a tribute to him. He'd be my pick for AFC Rookie of the Year. He's not playing like a rookie anymore. I think originally when he first started playing, his quickness through holes was nice to see. But the thing that amazed people was when he put his shoulder down into a linebacker or put his shoulder down into a defensive back, the other guy wound up on his back and John kept running. And uh, it was a sight to see. I saw the, the film of that, and he broke some runs in that film that made my mouth drool. John's got a, a great chance to be one of the better running backs ever to play in the game. I, I truly believe that. With young stars like Rookie of the Year John Stevens and a physical team of battle-hardened young veterans to lead the way, there is good reason for the optimism that shines among Coach Raymond Barry's team of character.